Well, good evening. I hope you can hear me okay. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening as we continue our series, Right With God. We've been looking at uh, some wonderful themes from Paul's letter to the Christians at Rome. This is, in fact, the last episode of this series, uh, Right With God. And we've been learning, I think, in this series, first of all, that we need to be made right with God, that we are sinners, and because we face God's judgment, uh, because of our sins, we need to be justified, to be made right with him. We've also learned, I think, that we can't do this ourselves, that try as we might, uh, there is no way we can make ourselves right with God. But the wonderful news, the great good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ, God's Son, has died on the cross, has been raised from the dead, in order that we might have salvation, in order that we might be justified and made right with God. This has been the, the theme that Paul has been talking about in this letter to the Romans. And now we come to the point, which I really want to make this a kind of climax uh, to the series. We've really come to the point where we might ask the question, how do I make it mine? How do I take this to myself? How is it that I personally, living in 2022, how is it that I can be personally made right with God? I need it. I can't do it myself. I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross uh, so that it might be possible for me to be made right with God. But how can I make it mine? And I hope that if you've never done it before, that by the end of our talk, you will uh, be sure about this, that you have made it yours and made salvation yours and that you, in fact, are right with God. We're going to discover that it has to do with the heart and it has to do with the mouth. And we're going to read about that in Romans chapter 10 and a very familiar passage, Romans chapter 10. And if we begin uh, through verse 6, halfway through verse 6, Paul says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Amen. We're going to talk tonight about the heart and the mouth, and more specifically about your heart and your mouth. And we're going to discover that this is something that is very definite. It's an experience that we can all have, and it's something that we must, in fact, have if we are going to be made right with God. But just before we get to this heart and mouth theme, Paul says there's something we need to clear away first. There's something we need to, to get rid of. We need to get rid of this idea that somehow being right with God depends on some distance I can go or some great thing I can do, or, or, or it depends in some way on my merits. And so he talks about, don't say in your heart, I need to ascend up into heaven, or I need to descend down into the abyss. It's a bit strange language, perhaps, but he's using hyperbole. And he's saying, don't think that salvation, this getting right with God, means that you have to do something great. <laughs> he's going to tell us that it's all been done for us. It's all been done already. Well, in the year 1510, a very devout German monk decided to make a pilgrimage to Rome. He was seeking God. He wanted to be right with God. He knew he wasn't right with God. And he was convinced that if only he could go to Rome, for him, Rome was the holy city. It was where the Pope was. And he believed that if he was able to go on this pilgrimage to Rome, that he would certainly find God and everything would be fine. And the story goes that when Rome came into view, as he was on the road, and he saw for the first time the buildings of Rome, he was completely overcome, and he fell on his face on the ground and lay prostrate before this holy city. And he felt, surely now I've come all this distance to Rome. I'll find the answer to my problem here. And so he went into Rome, and he went 
into the different religious ceremonies. Apparently, he attended seven masses one day, and he went to all the churches, and, and he went to the Vatican, and, and he even climbed. There was a staircase in Rome that they, that they believed, legend had it, that it was taken from, from Israel, and that this was the staircase that Jesus climbed up to Pilate's judgment hall. And he climbed up the staircase, and on every step, he did an act of penance, and he kissed the step, and he, he crawled up on his hands and knees barefoot. And at the end of it all, he was completely disillusioned. He knew that nothing had changed in his heart. He knew he wasn't forgiven. And of course, the monk's name was Martin Luther. And he came to realize, he came to understand that it wasn't on a pilgrimage. It wasn't doing something great. It wasn't going up into heaven. It wasn't going down into the deep. In Paul's language, the work had all been done. Dear friends, we need to grasp this first of all, that being right with God does not depend on you doing something great. It doesn't depend on some pilgrimage or some work that you can do or some prayer that you can say or some religious observance. God is not interested in that. You've got to get rid of all that kind of thinking. Paul says, don't even think it in your heart because he says, the great work has been done. Christ has come down. You don't need to go up to heaven to get Christ. He's already come down. And you don't need to go down into the, into the deep, into death to, to get him back because he has been raised from the dead. What Paul is saying is this, it doesn't depend on what you can do. It depends on what Jesus Christ has done. And so uh, when we get that cleared out of the way, what a revelation it is for some people. They're struggling. They want to be right with God, but they think it's all, I've got to do something wonderful. I've got to do some great thing. Not at all, dear friends. Clear that out of your mind. The work has been done when Jesus died on the cross. And now Paul says, the word is near you. In other words, what he's saying is that the opportunity for you to be right with God is right beside you. It's, you can put out your hand and take it. You don't need to go on a pilgrimage. You don't need to go and see anyone. It's right there. Now, you might be listening to me tonight, maybe in your bedroom, in your lounge, in your study. You might be listening on a phone. You might be listening at a laptop. You might be listening on YouTube. You might be listening through Zoom. I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're doing, but I can say this. Wherever you are, wherever you are at this very moment, the word is near you. You can be saved. You can be justified at this very moment, just where you are. Isn't that wonderful? And Paul says, it's all to do with the heart and the mouth. And so he says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, he says, the word is this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, did you notice in the next verse, he, he changes the order around because in this verse he said, you could confess with your mouth and believe with your heart. But then in the next verse, he says, for with the heart, man believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. Now, let me just explain that for one minute. It just simply means this. When Paul is speaking about this to begin with, he's quoting a verse from the Old Testament. And the Old Testament talks about the mouth first, and then it talks about the heart. And so Paul uses that, but then in verse 10, he turns the order around because this is what actually happens when someone is made right with God. It begins with the heart and then the mouth. And so it's believing in the heart and confessing with the mouth. Let's just think about that for the remaining minutes. Believing with the heart, confessing with the mouth. You know, when Paul talks about the heart, he uses this word in a special way that's used in the Bible. Now, we talk about the heart, and we think about the heart as it stands for love. It stands for affection. It stands for feeling. Well, it does in the Bible too, but it stands for more than that. It stands not just for our emotions. It stands for our intellect, for our reason. And it stands as well for our will, for our volition. And so sometimes the old preachers didn't get it right all the time. And I've heard many sermons about head believing and heart believing. But that's not a contrast the Bible makes at all in this passage. When Paul talks about believing in the heart, he's really talking about the whole person. He's talking about the core of my being. And yes, it involves my emotions and it involves my intellect and it involves my will. 
And what Paul is really saying, we're dealing with the essence of what I am. I have to exercise faith. What have I got to believe? That God has raised Jesus from the dead. Now, this doesn't simply mean that I believe the resurrection is true, although, of course, we have to believe the resurrection is true. But it's not simply saying, yes, I'm convinced with the evidence and I believe it's true. What Paul is saying here is, if I can paraphrase it like this, he's really saying that I need to put the trust for the salvation of my entire being in a resurrected Savior. I need to believe that Jesus died on the cross, he died for my sins, he rose from the dead, and when God raised him from the dead, he was telling me that it's not what I do, it's what he did, and he did enough. His price that he paid, of course, was far more than enough to save my soul and to forgive my sins. And so when I realized that, I believe that God raised him from the dead, that God was pleased and satisfied with what Jesus did on the cross, and I believe that in my heart. In other words, I trust a resurrected, a raised Savior who died on the cross and now is alive. Dear friends, can I ask you, have you done that? Have you believed in the heart? This is wonderful. And of course, this is exactly what happened in Paul's case himself when he was converted. You remember that before he became a Christian, he didn't believe for one minute that Jesus had been raised from the dead. He thought it was all a hoax. He believed that Jesus uh, was a blasphemer, that his death on the cross was just what he deserved. And these stories that were going around about him being alive, he didn't believe it for one minute until, of course, on the road to Damascus, he met the Lord Jesus and he believed immediately in his heart that God had raised him from the dead. And I believe this, when that happened, Paul realized the whole story is true. And at that moment on the road to Damascus, lying in the dust, he trusted a raised, resurrected savior. Dear friend, I'm glad that my savior isn't dead. He died, but he's not dead anymore, he's alive. And when I came to him as a young boy, I very simply believed that he could save me, and I trusted him to do it, and I believed in the heart. Have you done that? Believing in the heart, but then confessing with the mouth. One is internal, and the other is external. And Paul says that with the heart, man believes, but with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. Now, don't think of this, please, that confessing with your mouth is a kind of condition or it's kind of part two of salvation. The idea is that a confession with the mouth, and particularly for Jewish people, and particularly for Roman people, to confess with the mouth that Jesus is Lord is the evidence that they have become believers in their hearts. And so someone believes in their heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, that he died for me on the cross, and that his work on the cross is sufficient, and I trust him for the salvation of my soul. And then I don't think somebody can really believe in the Lord Jesus and keep it a secret for too long. I don't think that they can go through their whole life without ever confessing that Jesus is their Lord and Savior. You might say, don't we read in the Bible about secret disciples? Yes, we do. But the whole reason we read about them in the Bible is that they didn't stay secret. They became public disciples. There's a man called Joseph of Arimathea. You remember, he was a secret disciple, perhaps for years. But it came to the point when he made his stand and he very publicly made his confession that Jesus Christ was his Lord and Savior. Dear friend, I want to ask you, have you believed in your heart? And have you made an open confession that you are a believer? in the Lord Jesus, and that he is your Lord and Savior. This is the evidence. One is the inward, the internal believing. It's something just between me and God. Nobody else knows anything about it. The other is the evidence of that as I confess him as my Lord and Savior. And do you know how they did that in Bible times? Do you know how they did that in the New Testament? They did that by being baptized as believers in the Lord Jesus. And as soon as it was practicable, after they trusted Christ, they made a public declaration 
And even today, when we baptize a believer in the Lord Jesus, very often we ask him or her as they're standing in the water, are you a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? And invariably, of course, they confess him as their Lord and Savior, and they're baptized on their confession of faith, and they're making a public stand and saying, yes, I am a believer in the Lord Jesus. Now, Please don't misunderstand me. Baptism never saves anyone. And you can be saved and you can go to heaven without being baptized. But baptism is an open public confession of something that happened in your heart when you believed on the Lord Jesus. And so Paul says, you believe in the heart and you confess with the mouth. Now, I want to ask you as we come to the end of the series, have you ever done that? And what's stopping you doing that now? You can do it at this very moment. You can believe in your heart. You can trust the Lord Jesus to be your savior. And then you can pick up the phone or you can go and see somebody or you can, you can turn to somebody who's with you and you can confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and savior. There is nothing that brings the Christian greater peace. There's nothing that brings greater joy than to hear someone confess I've just become a believer. I've trusted the Savior for myself, and he is my Lord and Savior. I remember a few years ago, at the end of a, a, a children's meeting, a mother came to me with her daughter, and she said, my daughter has got something to tell you. And very shyly, this young girl said to me, I've trusted the Lord Jesus to be my Savior. I'll tell you, that is a confession. That is a confession. It's a confession of faith in Christ. And, and I don't know about how she felt about it. She was probably quite nervous about it. But I'll tell you, it filled my heart with joy to think that here is somebody, just a young girl, but she's believed in the Lord Jesus. And now she is confessing that he is her Lord and Savior. I want to ask you, dear friend, have you done that? Why not do it now? Paul says, the word is near you. You know, gospel services, these gospel talks, gospel meetings are the most exciting things in the universe. If you want a thrill, get into gospel preaching, get into sharing the gospel, because there is the potential when this message is preached that somebody can be listening and saying, yes, I'm not right with God. I know I'm a sinner. I know I need to get this right. I know, I know I can't do it myself. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me, and I'm going to, by a definite act of my will, I'm going to believe, I'm going to trust in him, I'm going to express to him my faith in him. I'm going to rely on him to save me, and I'm going to confess him as my Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father, we do pray tonight that somebody might just simply do this. We know that salvation is so simple and the step that can be taken is so simple that it can by its very simplicity become a stumbling block people think they have to do great things we pray that somebody listening to this message tonight may believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that jesus is their lord and savior we give thanks for the savior what he's done on the cross and we pray that somebody may come into the good of all the savior has done and be right with god tonight we pray for thy blessing in the lord's name amen